Podcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the Ignite EdTech Podcast with Craig Kemp, taking the pulse of educators from all over the globe and bringing what you need every week. When you need answers, you go to the experts. Created by an educator for educators and streaming to the world. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Ignite EdTech Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm thrilled to have your support. The Ignite EdTech Podcast will continue to drop a new episode every week and will bring you news, tips, solutions, ways of learning, and interviews with the best of the best in the education and EdTech industry. As most of you know, I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. He has his own podcast production studio that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. Last week, I encouraged you to think about the strategies you have in place for integrating technology into your classroom or school. Thank you for sharing as always. Check out the social streams for more. This week, I want to ask you who your go-to professional learning network members are for developing your confidence and competence in edtech learning. For me, it's my Twitter PLN, and then specific members within that, including my incredibly talented Ignite EdTech team. Please share with me via our Ignite EdTech social streams who you love to connect with and why. I'd love to give them an avenue for promotion through this channel too. I look forward to hearing your responses soon. A tool that has positively impacted the authentic and purposeful use of technology into classrooms and meeting rooms that I have worked in is Explain Everything. Explain Everything has been my go-to digital whiteboard for a long, long time. And since COVID, it has become one of the best in class for remote teaching. It supports millions of teachers, students, thinkers, and anyone who wants to express themselves better globally. You can create collaborative learning experiences where students and teachers can share thoughts and ideas in real time. As someone who values student voice and choice, one of my favorite elements to explain everything is the ability to strengthen leadership and collaboration skills by giving students the tools to create and share their own tutorials, animated stories, and presentations. I highly recommend that you take a look at explaineverything.com. The link is in the description below. Last week, we talked about EdTech strategy in your schools. If you're interested in learning more, go back and listen to last week's episode. I also asked you to share your favorite tools for EdTech in your school. Here's a selection of the tools that you shared that you love. Education Perfect, Flipgrid, Nearpod, Seesaw, Common Sense Media, and Hologo World. Thank you for sharing. Make sure you check out these links in the podcast notes below and see what people are raving about. This week, I wanted to focus on EdTech professional learning in schools after I launched the Ignite EdTech professional learning portal this week. Over the coming weeks and months, the Ignite EdTech team will be launching multiple learning courses for the different learners in your school building and beyond. Starting this week, our first course is live to support IT support staff in schools better understand teachers, learning processes, and pedagogy. Coming soon, we'll be offering courses for teachers, students, parents, and edtech companies to help you all move from surviving to thriving in the complex and ever-changing world that we live in. Learn what you want, when you want, and at a pace that suits you. You can learn more by visiting learning.igniteedtech.com. The link is in the description below. One of the critical elements to building a sustainable and forward-thinking edtech strategy and program is professional learning. I say it all the time, focus on the people. Building capacity in the people in your building is the most important part of any successful strategy. Yes, it starts with culture, but at some point, we have to move people to hold a confidence and competence in using technology to support others in their learning. We need to support teachers, leaders, and parents to be confident in the use of technology and build a culture where everyone wants to thrive and learn how to use technology to add value to learning. When we think of the bell curve that shows us the uptake of technology adoption in a school setting, we understand our people better. Most schools have 5-10% to of their people that are innovators and leaders when it comes to technology. These are the people that try new things, take risks, and support their learners and colleagues on a daily basis. Unfortunately, at the other end of the scale, we always have the 5-10% to 10% of people that are laggards. 
those that will either push back against using technology or will actively try to bring your ideas, tools and strategies down. One of the common phrases used by these people is, this is the way I've always done things. Their attitude is not about trying new things and changing the way they teach, but about talking about the past and their successes in doing what they've always done. Unfortunately for them, we live in one of the most transformational times in human history, where we have to adapt to an environment where we learn, unlearn, and relearn everything in our teaching toolkit. The way to make a movement happen is to empower the majority. The 60-70% to 70 of your learning community that wants to change are willing to grow, but don't know how. They're moldable, adaptable, and open to change. It's your job to use your knowledge and expertise of your context to find the right strategies to make this successful. One of those strategies that doesn't change from site to site and context to context is the need to focus on people and put their learning first. Part of the work I do with schools is developing the strategy and professional learning plan. And the first thing I ask people to do is ask their teachers what they want and need. This is the easy part. Get some small wins, teach them what they want and what they think they need, and slowly but surely start introducing new learning that builds on their knowledge and helps move their skill set to where you need to be as a school. As you continue to drive innovation and change through the authentic and purposeful use of technology, use the teacher next door model as a way forward. Basically, this means not using your tech experts or innovators to lead training and learning, but using your majority to lead training. Teachers are far more likely to follow a movement if there are like-minded people supporting and leading them. It's simple. Have teachers who are at the same or lower level than others lead their learning and others will follow. If they can do it, I can do it. That's what you want to achieve. Change mindsets one learning experience at a time. And remember, what teachers want more than anything else, time. Give them time and they'll thank you for it. Time to learn, time to grow, and time to explore. And if you need help along the way, ask. Please share your strategies and ideas for professional learning so we can discuss them on next week's show. I would love to hear from you. Every week, I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes, an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day, with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Dan Ryder. Let's have a listen to the chat. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Dan Ryder. You might know him from Twitter as at Wicked Descent, where he shares a lot of positivity and creative ideas. Dan is an experienced English teacher and improv coach from Maine, USA. He currently serves as the education director of the Success and Innovation Center at Mount Blue Campus. In his spare time, he consults and speaks in multiple spaces. And on top of all of this, he's also a published author. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? I am, and it is an honor to be here, my friend. Awesome. Let's go. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? So my current role is uh, as director of the Success and Innovation Center at Mount Blue Campus. I run a problem solving studio where we help all students and faculty deal with whatever problems they might be facing in their lives. So they walk through the door and they they say, oh, this is what's happening with me today. And we say, how might we be helpful? And so that might be something academic. It might be something social, emotional. It might be something vocational. It might be something deeply personal. And it might be something that is as uh, silly and as innocuous as I can't figure out how to charge my phone. It could be any of those things. And uh, we work with them to help them figure out a way to solve that problem address that problem and connect them to the resources that they might need in order to uh, to get to a long-term solution. So really the goal is to develop resilient problem solvers. What a cool role. What a cool opportunity that your, your school's put into place. I really love that. And what about, Dan, the, the, let's talk about bigger picture education now, global education. What excites you about education today? Oh, there are so many things. Um, but the the biggest thing that's exciting me about education right now is that we have this network of committed educators who are working to try to make the world an authentically better place. 
and are dealing with the gnarliness and the far too frequently ignored problems. And uh, now we're we're actually trying to address them. We're talking about systems of, of systemic racism, systems of inequality and inequities. And it excites me that when you have kind of a galvanized movement and you have something that you can rally around, that we have educators who are stepping up, uh, including myself, that have uh, benefited far too long from our privilege without really addressing those problems. And I feel like we have the tools, we have the resources, we have everything that we, we need in order to make actual change happen. And as tragic as the circumstances are around the reasons why we have to make this movement now, it gives me hope and it sparks uh, my creativity. It sparks my my interests and desires and the reason why I got into education to begin with um, to work on that uh, right now. Yeah, I love that. And I know you do a lot with educational technology and a lot of the people listening today um, are here to, to learn a little bit more about EdTech. What's your best advice for educators in relation to educational technology? So the best thing that I can add, I, I can suggest to people is to use the same question that I learned early on in my teaching from this organization here in Maine called Seed. Um, it's an organization that no longer exists, but it was it was amazing. It was this uh, peer-to-peer professional development model, and it was outstanding. And in Seed, we used this framework called High Quality Teaching and Learning Through Technology. And there were there was a set of it was like a rubric almost to go by when you're you're integrating tech. But the number one thing on there, the one that I always hold on to is value added. What does the technology bring for value added to your experience? And so often we get excited about a new set of bells and whistles. But until we like actually ask that question, we don't realize, oh, all this does is the same thing I'm already doing, but just in digital. Or it does the same thing that I'm already doing but with a fancier looking screen um, and we forget that you need to really ask yourself, what is this bringing to the table for the educator? What's it bringing to the table for the student in terms of adding real benefit to the learning experience? And what about the ed tech tools that you use? What are maybe one or two of the current tools that you're really loving the use of in your day-to-day work? So there are two kind of big collections of tools that, that I use day-to-day, or I guess really three, three collections that benefit me greatly, and I find them super flexible and easy to use. So uh, one is we're a Google suite, GS suite. I get the name wrong every time because it feels like it changes daily. It doesn't. I just feel that way. But we're a Google school, so the, the G suite, is just super flexible and people don't realize that just in slides how much you can do in terms of creativity and creation just just with that one tool that's a really robust collection of tools that i use all the time uh the other is uh or one of the two others is we also have one-to-one macbook airs so we have a lot of the apple products and i find kino is uh, especially the latest editions um, of, of Kino and Pages are incredible design tools that can be used for all sorts of great stuff. And then finally, and this is a relatively recent adoption, but man, Adobe has so much good stuff in the creative cloud. Holy poo! I was going to say something inappropriate. I used to feel like it wasn't worth the energy it took to learn them. Um, and what I've discovered in the in the past six months to a year, is that it doesn't take that much energy to learn how to do some basic things that can really be transformative. What a great suite of products there. And I couldn't agree more with every single thing that you've talked about there. I'm a huge advocate for all of those. And I think that sort of leads us on perfectly to the next sort of question, which is all around learning. Learning is super important to us as educators. Tell us about one book or one resource that you've been reading lately, or just one of your all-time favorites, and tell us about why we should be exploring it. Uh, well, my all-time, you know, when we're talking about creativity, and we're going back to that, is I go back to another suite of books, 
which is the collective works of Austin Kleon. Steal like an artist, show your work, uh, and then, oh, the latest one, the name of which always escapes me because I've only read it like six times instead of like a dozen. But show your work and steal like an artist. I actually buy those books for graduating seniors and put them in their hands, especially show your work. But they're they're great to just have by your desk. They're applicable to any form of work, any form of creative endeavor, any form of teaching. And they they constantly inspire me. And when I'm getting stuck and when I'm not sure what to do um, next or just feeling in one of those, <laughs> it's been very easy in an era of pandemic uh, to kind of fall into a malaise where you're just questioning everything. And you pull that out and you, you, you pull one of those two out, uh, show your work in particular. And I go, okay, that's all right. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to the gospel of Cleon and um, see what I can find uh, and start documenting something or just put some notion out on Twitter. Let it exist outside of me for a moment. And sometimes that's all it takes. That's really cool. And on top of all of this, you're also in this space yourself. You're a published author. And I know that that it takes a lot of energy and enthusiasm and and passion and patience to be an author. Tell us a little bit about your writing and why we should read your book. Oh, uh, well, uh, you shouldn't. It's terrible. Uh, oh, wait, no. Ah, I always forget that. Publisher always says, don't do that. Um, no. uh, so my book is uh, that I co-authored with my good friend, Amy Burval. Uh, you should follow her at Amy Burval on the Twitters if you if you haven't, because she's amazing. Uh, it's called Intention, Critical Creativity in the Classroom, and it's currently published by Blend Education from John Spencer. The process of writing the book was uh, kind of amazing because Amy and I had become really good friends through the process of sharing ideas back and forth, her in Hawaii, me in Maine. And uh, working with our students kind of collaboratively, even at times, but a couple of tweets back and forth. Uh, and we we come up with a new strategy to use in our classroom that day. And then we try it out and we tell each other how it went or we get sparked by something else we'd see. So putting it together as a book, we thought it was like a natural fit because it was just, oh, these are like things that we're already doing. This is great. This won't be hard at all, except writing words on a page is quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> when you are trying to capture something that comes naturally to you and also you know is a little weird and a little eccentric and a, a little off kilter from what people uh, typically encounter in teaching and learning. <laughs> so you want to make sure that, that when you're framing it, it, it's accessible to folks and it invites people in. And that was that was one of the, the most challenging parts about putting it together was to make sure that the book created a place for people who weren't comfortable in those spaces to feel like, oh, oh, I can do this um, because I'm just a schmuck from Maine. I mean, I'm not I'm not like like some like uh, you know, brilliant genius, you know, who sits around in his lab and comes up with all this stuff. Um, I just I'm just a, a guy who makes a ton of mistakes, but is willing to try things. Hopefully, the book provides angles in for people to do that. Um, there's 40 plus activities for using creative expression in any classroom in there. And they're connected to educational technologies in, in terms of they show you how you could amplify. But they're really, they're tech agnostic, they're content agnostic, meaning you can amplify them through technology or you can choose not to. Almost everything in there you can do with or without tech. They're applicable across the content areas. So we're really proud of it. It's been out for a few years now, and um, we, we think uh, people have really benefited from uh, taking a look at it. That's really cool. I'll make sure the links are in the description below for people to check it out and maybe buy their own copy. Now, Dan, what's the best way for listeners today to follow and connect with you? The best way is always Twitter, because that's where I kind of live and breathe. So it's at Wicked Decent. But you can also find me on Instagram at Wicked Decent. And uh, you can also find me on my uh, website, uh, danrider207.com. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, my friend. Next week, join me for episode 39 of the Ignite EdTech podcast, when I'm joined by Chris Woods and Noah Daniel. 
One of the things I love doing is giving away prizes as a thank you for tuning in, listening, and hopefully subscribing to the Ignite EdTech podcast. Last week, I gave away copies of Denisha Murph and Craig Frelick's books. To win, you needed to complete the form at bit.ly slash edtechwin. The winners have already been contacted directly by me, and they are Priya Rajagopalan and Richard Brewster. Congratulations to you both. This week, I'm giving away two copies of Dan Ryder's books. To win this incredible prize, you need to go to bit.ly slash edtechwin and complete the simple form. It'll take you less than a minute to do. The link is in the description below. Competition closes on Wednesday the 3rd of March, and the winners will be contacted directly by me and announced on next Friday's podcast episode. Good luck. Thank you for being an extremely important part of the Ignite EdTech podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, smash that subscribe button and share it with your colleagues, friends, and families. Please remember to spend two minutes to rate the podcast so we can reach even more educators and edtech enthusiasts globally. Please share your favorite part of today's episode by tagging me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And don't hesitate to ask me questions so I can answer them in an upcoming episode. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more, and I'll see you again next week. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.